In this video, I would like to share with you one of my favorite games, Lubomir Vtaknik and Ogden Zweiten. d4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, c4, bishop g7, knight c4, and kingside castling. King's Indian defense. e4, d6, bishop e2. Here we see the e5 move from Zweiten. He had just transferred his king to safety. He's ready to play from the center now. And this e5 advance is actually the first step of the main plan. It increases the pressure on the opponent's central d4 pawn. So he will want to understand his opponent's intentions and can determine his own strategy accordingly. Of course, this e5 advance is not a pawn sacrifice because d takes e5 and, for example, let the queens exchange. If the undefended e5 pawn is taken, the answer is fairly simple, and that is the knight takes e4. He'd be taking back the pawn he gave and demand for the opposing knight with a discovered attack. Here, one of the most respected and powerful plays to continue against e5 is the d5, Petrosian continuation. The main goal of this continuation is to prevent the knight from maneuvering towards that wing for the kingside attack that we will see later in the game. Let's get back to the game. Against e5, Vtaknik chose kingside castling, the most flexible response. He still hasn't fully shown his intentions and has maintained the tension in the center. And now, knight c6. Once again, he's increasing the pressure on the center, forcing his opponent to make a decision. The bishop e3 move could be preferred again by keeping the tension in the center. But here, Vtaknik's choice was d5. Now, knight e7. Of course, in this position, you might think of this question. Why would a very powerful Grand Master like Zweiten gift his opponent d5? A space-winning advance with tempo? Because that's how Zweiten wanted the center closed. And why is that? Because we know very well that when the center is closed, attacks from the wing become much more convenient and safe. Speaking of the basic plans of the two Grand Masters here, Zweiten will try to attack the opponent's king, thanks to the e5 pawn, which points to a space superiority towards the opponent's king side. While Vtaknik will try to advance from the queen side, which he has a space advantage. So, we can say that a speed race has literally started between the two Grand Masters. Here, Fataknik continues the game with Knight d2. It's a pretty standard setup. The main idea of this Knight d2 move is to pave the way for the f-pawn and prepare the f3 advance, which is of great importance. We'll get a better understanding of this in a moment. Now, Knight e8. Yes, what did we just say? Zweiten will want to attack the opponent's king. But what could the method be? Again, given the pawn chain at the center. Of course, the method would be to advance the pawns while also creating weakness on the opposing side, allowing the opposing king to be more easily accessible, and the f5 advance, which targets the opponent's central chain's foundation has now been prepared with the knight e8 move. Of course, this piece will not feel very happy in the e8 square, but it's a temporary knight maneuver. Now, against knight e8, b4. Of course, Vtaknik immediately began his attack from the other wing. Vtaknik's goal is to create weaknesses in his opponent's wing with pawn advances from the queen's side. He intends to advance by aiming for the d6 pawn, which is in the middle of his opponent's central pawn chain.
against b4, f5, and now c5. Of course, the c5 advance is important. The d6 pawn is now alone after the exchanges from the d6 square and becomes a target for the opponent. At the same time, after the c5 captures, a nice counter game by Ftaknik can be formed from the c vertical. Here's knight f6. As said before, we are bringing this unhappy, dissatisfied piece to the kingside attack. At the same time, there is increased pressure on the center. Ftaknik's choice here is the f3 advance we just mentioned. But why? Because apparently, he was advancing to the queen side, and time was of the essence. Why would he suddenly turn his attention towards the king side his opponent was attacking? Here is the proper way to explain it. Because he wanted to move his knight from d2 to c4 for a proper queen side attack. The e4 pawn could have left undefended. Of course, you could make such argument. Let him take the f5 first, without wasting any time. Then, move his knight to c4. But an exchange from the f5 square could provide Zweiten with a very dynamic counter game, while leaving the center in the hands of his opponent. That's why f3. At the same time, the f3 has some good ideas. Zweiten will want to advance g4 at some point. But the f3 advance has increased the control of this square. By pulling back the reachable point in the center a little more, he takes his opponent's time from the pawn advances that the opponent wants to make and gains enough time for his own counterplay. At the same time, we can see how important this a7 g1 cross is for both defense and offense. Against f3, Zweiten continues to gain space from the king's side with f4 in no time. He also prevented the queen's bishop from coming to e3. Now, knight c4. By increasing the pressure on the d6 pawn. And g5. When we were talking about an unhappy piece, we could say that the knight in e7 was unhappy with its life. This knight can open the g6 square to join the kingside attack and prepare g4 advances after h5 in the future. Now, against g5, Ftaknik continued with a4, knight g6, as expected, and bishop a3. Although there are two pawns in between, we can understand that this bishop is putting pressure on square d6. And here, Zweiten plays rook f7, which is one of the most standard King's Indian defense setups. Please keep that in mind. It's a very standard idea, because the rook f7 is a move with such beautiful functions. First, after the exchanges that the opponent will make from d6 in the near future. Imagine this, rook will come to c1, knight will come to b5, and the knight c7 and rook c7 moves in the open c vertical can arrive long before the opponent's attack, and Zweiten may never have time to attack from the king's side. However, the rook will beautifully defend these ideas in the 7th horizontal. Second, it will clear the f8 square for the king's bishop. This will help increase the protection of the d6 pawn, because we know very well that we don't want to end the tension unless there's a good reason. We want to keep it. A third idea is that in the seventh horizontal that will open after the bishop f8, if the rook g7 or h pawn advances, rook h7 can also support the king side attack. Against rook f7, b5, now, d6 is on demand. As we just said, the tension could be maintained in f8. But, I'm guessing Zweiten must have been afraid of an advance like b6, such as aiming at the very foundation of this chain. 
he immediately captured c5, and now bishop takes c5. Yes, this could be considered a small victory for Ftaknik, because it's usually a good sign for you when your opponent eliminates such tension. Of course, first of all, square c5 can now be used by a piece. At the same time, the bishop's arrival at c5 helps the defense, and it's also a good square for the bishop to use for queenside pressure ideas. Now, h5. He is preparing g4. a5, g4, b6, and g3. King h1 was made here. First of all, this g3 advance feels like a huge strategic mistake because we are all well aware that we do not want the wing from which we are attacking to close. It appears that the h3 move against g3 will completely eliminate their attacking opportunities, but the truth is that it is not at all like that. A little later, when the knight leaves the f6 square, the queen will join the attack, and the h3 advance could have shattered the king side by inviting the bishop takes h3 sacrifices. That's why against g3, Ftaknik doesn't touch that piece. It's an important principle. Do not advance pawns from the wing where your opponent plays, unless it is mandatory. He plays king h1 here. Why? There were no pins for the king. However, in the near future the queen will want to come to h4, will want to mate from h2. And since this cannot be blocked with h3 advances because the bishop takes h3 sacrifices, he opened the g1 square to defend on the bishop's behalf. And now, knight h7, the idea of the queen joining the attack. And here, of course, Ftaknik is not after a pawn. He's trying to place his knight maybe in d6 or b6. Why is that important? because one of the most important attacking pieces in King's Indian defense is the Queen's Bishop in c8, and if the Knight can settle in these two squares, it can eliminate this Bishop and seriously take away the opponent's attacking chances. And no time is wasted. Queen h4. Now he wants to mate in one move. We just explained why you can't advance h3, so the only option is Bishop g1. And here, Guys, we see the bishop h3 sacrifice from Zweiten before the knight in c4 settles on b6 or d6. This bishop has joined the attack. Of course, it's a bishop sacrifice, and given the rest of the game, accepting that bishop sacrifice would be a much better option. For instance, after g takes h3 and queen takes h3, Yes, I admit that he has a mate demand with the g2 advance, and the only other way to protect it was to give the rook with rook f2 and fall behind in exchange. But even that can be agreed to. This continuation path could have been preferred due to the bishop pair advantage, the significant slowing of the opponent's attack, and Ftaknik's serious counterplay coming just in time from the queen's side. But against bishop h3, here, Ftaknik misses his opponent's finishing tactical move and plays b takes c7. Here's what he thinks. In a moment, he will advance d7, and one of his two pawns that has reached the seventh horizontal can be promoted to queen. But just a single tempo changes everything. Bishop takes g2. Yes, it's mandatory to take it. Guys, you can pause the video and think. There's a perfect move. Queen h3. Queen sacrifice. This sacrifice must be accepted. Otherwise, if the king escapes, there is a mate from g2. And after h3, all the moves and responses are mandatory. After knight g5, king 2, and knight h4, Ftaknik left the game. Because if the h1 escaped we'd see the perfect mate with g2. Chess is a beautiful game. We see how two knights and a pawn make a beautiful mate. That's why Ftaknik left the game to knight h4. Thank you so much for watching.
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video please like, leave a comment, and subscribe to this channel, and click on the bell icon to stay updated with my new videos. Hope to see you in the next video. Take care.